Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So I try not to rant too much on my channel here. I try to be rational and logical and give you the reasons behind things based upon reality. And even when I do rant, it's not too bad because even though my rants aren't as coherent as I usually would like to be and give you all of that, at the very least, I can point towards other videos where I have given you those reasons and that logic and those fundamental bases in reality, or I will cover it in that exhaustive form sometime in the future. But sometimes you just gotta rant. Because sometimes you gotta stop pussyfooting around and you need to call a spade a spade just so that you're clear. And the clear, distinct thing that I want to say today, I'm sure is no shock to a great many of you, but I would say that the majority of people who really back this quote-unquote progressive ideology are insane. But the further reason why I wanted to say that is because I want to show that with their control of the world and the insanity that then ensues, they're trying to more and more ghettoize us sane people so that we don't have anything to do with the world. Or at the very least, with their control over it. And I'm here to say today, we should be thankful for that. All right, so before I get into my entire rant, I just want to let everyone know that there are three links in the description and on the pinned comment. They are the three links for my three graphic novels. The first one is the link to the Second Chance campaign for Thomas Valiant, my published graphic novel. The second one is for the campaign that is now in demand on Indiegogo, The Valiant Heroes. It will be printing somewhere around the end of summer, early fall this year, and you have to use that link because it is shadow banned on Indiegogo itself. And the third link is for my upcoming fantasy graphic novel, Crom the Destroyer. It is a return to the basics of low fantasy. I'm trying to go back to the original mythological characters that Robert E. Howard used to create his characters of Cull and Conan and Solomon Cain and reinvigorate all of that in one character, drawing again upon those ancient Celtic myths. And that campaign is going to launch in, I think, 13 days from now. So you should go over on the Early Bird page and sign up. Why? Because if you leave your email there to sign up on the Early Bird page, you will be sent an email to let you know when exactly the project goes live, and you will get a free exclusive pinup poster with your order. It is exclusive because it's not available in the campaign itself. You can only get it if you sign up early. And this is a brand new piece of art that I got done specifically specifically for this poster for those people who sign up early. And as I indicated with my books, I'm trying to get back to the basics. I'm trying to extract everything from this nonsense and insanity that we see around us today in the culture and especially within entertainment and just give you good old fashioned fun adventure stories. And you're looking at some of the beautiful art for my graphic novels in the background. So if any of that sounds or looks appealing to you at all, click on those links in the description and go on over and see if my graphic novels are for you. So back to what I am going to rant about. Let's begin here. I am someone who tries, at the very least tries, to be charitable to people on the other side. And honestly, a long time ago, I used to think that people of the quote-unquote progressive mindset were just misinformed. But the more and more I interacted with these people and their ideology, that fell by the wayside. And that was replaced in my mind by an idea that, well, you know, if you just corner them with reason and logic and show them reality, then they'll abandon this insanity. And no, no, that wasn't it either. That didn't work. And so I went on to think about the fact that, well, it's just a grift. Most people who believe this ideological bent, they're just doing it for some other reason. They just want to ingratiate themselves or make themselves money or some other thing. But no, no, after doing this for five years on my channel here and going to the horse's mouth for all of this information from these companies, no, a lot of these people really believe what they're saying. So that was replaced in my mind by an idea that, well, it's just a minority of these people who actually truly believe this stuff in their political ideology. And again, the more and more I delve into the world of this progressive mindset, no, no, I find that the people who support this ideology, yeah, the majority of them actually believe this stuff. And so all that trying to be charitable was just boiled down by the other side until I realized, really, that the majority of the people who support this political ideology, now whether or not it's the vast majority, well I won't say that, I'll just say a majority. The majority of the people who support this ideology, yeah, they're insane. 
And I've done videos over the course of my channel talking about how they have these dark triad traits and how this virtue signaling is nothing more than an attention grab and all this kind of thing. But yeah, let's just lay all of that flowery language and explanation aside and just call them what they are. They're insane. More accurately, they're delusional insane because they deny reality over and over again. So I'm going to leave that there for a few minutes, and I'm going to talk about something tangential to this, where I came into this entire thing. So I'm not someone who really uses social media. I just had to get on it at one point in order to contact some people, and then I found out that it really I should be using it to actually connect with my audience because, well, after my last book, I found out that you don't put all your eggs in one basket because even though I have like 23,000, 21,000 subscribers on YouTube, I wasn't able to reach as many of them as I usually did because right before the book actually went on sale, there was a hurricane in the place where I lived and it knocked out my power for about a month and I wasn't able to upload on my normal schedule. And because I missed one video, YouTube just cut my entire reach for my videos in half. On top of that, Indiegogo decided to shadow ban my campaign so that you can't actually search for it. So I realized that, yeah, I need to expand my reach in order to get this information out to my audience. And the thing is that I came into Twitter when it was a progressive dystopian social credit system. So I wasn't used to it being anything but. So if you've been there before that, you might not see the amount of change that has happened since Elon Musk took over Twitter. And no, I'm not some Elon Musk fanboy by any means, but there has been changes, good or bad, that's up to you. Those changes, however, have included that the people that I actually get to see tweets from or that get to see mine possibly has expanded very much. And I get to hear some of the things from the other side. Previously, no, you got set into a ghetto so that no one could hear what you had to say if you had anything conservative to say. And at the same time, that blocked you from hearing what the other side had to say. I'll give you a funny example of this since I'm being sort of loose with this video. I actually replied to something that Alex Ross posted because I follow Alex Ross because he posts some beautiful art. He did a post where there were multiple pictures. Some of them were of Superman and Wonder Woman. They were deflecting bullets. And I asked a serious question because I'm someone who writes comics. I asked, would that happen the same way today? Bullets back when this trope began were actually different. They were a solid mass. They're not like that today. So would this still work today? And a lot of people did reply to me. Most of them replied saying things like, you're way overthinking this. And I said to myself, have you met me? But anyways, the funny thing was that I was going back through my feed at the end of the week and I wanted to see something else. And I noticed that Alex Ross actually deleted that tweet. Now I know that it could be for a million reasons, but in the back of my mind, I'm wondering, I wonder if he deleted the tweet because I was actually getting more replies and more traction from my question than he was getting on his tweet itself. And he was getting tagged in all of these things. But again, the reason why I bring up that story is I think Twitter works in a different way now where you have to listen to the other side unless you completely block them out manually. And I don't block anybody. When this stuff started appearing in my timeline, I said, should I block these people? I really don't want to hear what they have to say. But then I thought, no, no, I'm not going to block anyone. There's only two accounts I've ever blocked in the entire time I've used the thing. One is a spam account. And the second one is Barack Obama because, well, that's a spam account. But anyways, some comic things started showing up in my feed and I decided to read them. Some stuff from the other side. And I'm going to read you some of this here just to show you the level of insanity. I'll post them in the background if you want to read the entire thing because I'm not reading the entire thing. And by the way, does anybody know of a good free screen capture program that I can use. There must be a free one out there somewhere. I can remember using them in the early 1990s, but I can't find a good free one right now. And no, I'm not going to pay anything. I'll just do my normal print screen, paste, crop, save. Oh, and I'm not asking anybody to contact these people at all. I'm not going to black out their names, but I'm not doing this so that they get harassed in any way. So the tweet thread is about Chris Claremont's run on the X-Men and how Colossus is the symbol of getting out from underneath the patriarchy and at the same time a symbol of gender fluidity. 
So they're talking about where Colossus is stuck in his metal form and Dazzler has to apply all this makeup to him in order to make him look human so he can actually go out. Anyways, I'll read you some of this tweet thread. And by the way, this guy has 16,000 followers and he actually does other stuff, which I'll discuss in a minute. So, you know, he has some influence. He has some audience out there. It's not just some random guy who's getting one retweet. It begins, Uncanny X-Men number 245, titled Men, features an intriguing scene of gender role subversion in which the visually hyper-masculine Colossus is forced to wear makeup in order to pass as human and thereby participate in a male bonding ritual. The sequence opens with Colossus lying in a barber's chair while Dazzler, the most feminine presenting member of the team, applies makeup to his face, even as he protests, saying, Allison, men don't wear such things. Dazzler dismisses him. Oh, poo, she says. Men also don't have bodies of organic chrome steel. In this assertion, Allison is fundamentally arguing that being a mutant places Colossus outside the very concept of hegemonic masculinity. He is already genderqueer as a result of his superpower and is therefore empowered to deviate from established gender norms. In this simple statement, Allison is accidentally articulating scholar Ramsey Foiswa's concept of queer mutinity in canon. Yes, I'm going to butcher names, by the way. In his Eisner-winning text, the New Mutants, Fazwa argues that X-Men comics explore kinship forged through a shared marginalization and acceptance of intersectional identities. Essentially, they're a queer found family that is found specifically through their queerness. Colossus seems to embrace the moment. Philosophically, the association with chrome steel might also invite a comparison to Donna Haraway's seminal argument in The Cyborg Manifesto, that the cyborg body is empowered to deviate from gender norms by being already abnormal. Colossus is not a cyborg, of course, but he certainly looks like one, and since his aesthetic and its effect on what society expects from him as a man is the subject of the exchange, there's merit in applying cyborg feminism. All in all, it's a playful scene that offers a rare, brief, textual exploration of gender deviancy with a seemingly positive result. Meanwhile, the irony that Peter has to wear makeup to participate in a masculine ritual is a fun subversion of the hegemonic masculinity in itself. All right, enough of that. So before I move on to the insanity that is the statements itself, I want to address, first of all, the elephant in the room. That one, this is just some random person, and so why am I listening to them to begin with? And two, it's Chris Claremont, so he meant to do these things, or so they claim, over and over again. One, to some extent, he is a random guy, he does have 16,000 followers, but at the same time, he not only puts this stuff out on Twitter, he also goes around lecturing about it. And not only that, he also goes on other people's podcasts and talks about the exact same thing. He has his own YouTube channel where he posts some of these lectures, and yes, I've listened to some of these lectures, and yes, I've listened to some of these podcasts, and yes, it is the same insanity. And he's not alone. I followed some of the things he retweets to other smaller, much smaller, some of them, Twitter accounts where they're doing the exact same thing. I'll put some of those up in the background too. Here's another one about the X-Men where this guy is talking about how Cyclops becomes the leader of the X-Men through patriarchal standards. But the point is that I've heard all of this before at Marvel.com. They write articles about it, about things like how our comics were always coded as alphabet people representation this way or that in a subtextual way that most people didn't actually get at the time. Or I've listened to podcast after podcast with Women of Marvel or This Week in Marvel, other things like that, where they talk about this stuff all the time and they bring up these things. And of course, I listen to and read other articles from people like Kelly Sudakonic or G. Willow Wilson, where they give interviews with people like the New York Times, and they go over this exact same kind of thing. 
Again, as I said, I always thought that, yeah, they were just these people who, you know, they're random people who are trying to put on a face. They're trying to make it something that it's not. I didn't believe actual people out there in the world would buy this nonsense. But no, actual people out in the world actually buy this nonsense. People who follow and support this quote-unquote progressive narrative, yeah, they believe this stuff. They believe this insanity. Now, secondly to that, is the argument that people give over and over again, especially to me, when I post some opposite ideas on Twitter, that yeah, Chris Claremont always meant to do these things. This subtext was meant to be in there. It was always there because Chris Claremont wanted it there, because he's made this statement 20, 30, 40 years later, or N. Senti has made a statement just this last year saying, yes, Chris wanted it that way. I'm sorry, that's not good enough. I don't care. These stories are not Chris Claremont's private little diary. And if you think he's getting this subtextual message in there, you're insane. First off, I understand in putting some kind of subtext into your book or into your story. I do it myself. When I had Thomas Valiant running down a street when he was being particularly heroic, I thought, what am I going to name the street? Well, I named the street Prudential Avenue. Why? Because... Prudence is the first virtue of heroism. Now, I didn't create the scene so he could run down Prudential Avenue to show that he was heroic. It just happened out that way. And later on in the book, one of the characters is telling him when he's not being heroic, hey, you're not being prudent. You see, there is some subtext there. Or there's fun other things like the fact that I have a group of characters that are based upon birds. And my artist, Renzo, decided to give them this great entrance where they're standing on top of a basilica, a cathedral, which is beautiful in the background and has all of these gargoyles under their feet. And I thought to myself, well, I have to give this place a name because I have to put it on the map that you can get with the book. What am I going to name it? Well, I thought I'll name it St. Gaul's. Why? Because St. Gaul is the patron saint of birds. And these characters are all based upon birds. See, there is some subtext in there. But the point is, I'm putting in subtext as, first of all, an addition to the story so that everybody can understand and have access to it. Not everybody's going to get it, but I'm not trying to hide it. It's there for everybody. But what they're saying with Chris Claremont is, yeah, you see, he was trying to hide what he was putting into the story itself so that the other people who thought like him could see it and use their secret decoder ring of being progressive and thinking in a progressive way so that they could decode this extra message that he left between the lines in the subtext. And I'm thinking to myself, you people are insane. First of all, just thinking of that scenario itself for more than a second, you can see how insane it sounds. But secondly, I'm someone who has now produced comics. And I'll tell you right now, there's no way you're getting that dense of a message in that much of a coded way through the entire book with a comic as it is produced by multiple, multiple people. Producing such a thing is a collaborative effort. Within all of my books, I have, at the very least in some sections, a penciler and then an inker. On top of that, you have a colorist. On top of that, you have an editor. On top of that, you have the letterer. And I'm telling you right now, some of the things that I want to put in the story, even some of the essential things, do not translate all the way through. And you're telling me that this subtextual message of the, at the time, bizarre concept was stuck in there by Chris Claremont, who then went through both a penciler, who was taking his script, which, by the way, would be in a Marvel method, which is just very bare bones, and then translating that into pictures, and then, of course, you have the inker, who can completely change what the penciler himself is doing. And then you have the editor, who is going to cut down your story and say, get this out, we don't need this, no, no, no. And he's there at the time of Jim Shooter and the people after him, none of which was going to allow any of this nonsense, not even mentioning the fact that it had to go through the comics code. And on top of all of that, you have, again, the colorist, who can change things just by the way that they look, and the letterer who's going to come back to you at some point and say, well, you know, I know you want to put all of this in this word balloon, but it just ain't going to fit. Pare it down. And you're telling me, again, even if Chris Claremont himself was to come to me and say to me, yeah, I intended that from the very beginning when I wrote the scripts for these comics, I don't care. There is absolutely zero way he's getting through 
all of that, and the end product is still having this subtext in there for an audience to find and decipher, let alone the fact that this guy is trying to decipher it 40 years later. Not to mention the fact that quote-unquote progressivism, of which he's trying to convey so-called through this subtext, changes the meanings of words and ideas every five minutes. No, the idea that that subtext is there and that you're understanding exactly what it means, you're insane. So I replied to the last part of this tweet thread, and I said the following. Or maybe it's just a story for boys that has cool-looking people with cool-looking powers, and this scene was a joke to appeal to boys who like cool things. Occam's Razor. P.S. The people who come up with and believe these, in quotes, Theories belong in a padded room. And some guy replied to me saying, the people who come up with these theories are seeking to relate to the characters they love as much as you or I. Some are desperate to. There's a few bits of nonsense in this thread, but it's ultimately harmless headcanon. And I replied to that by saying, in a sane world governed by reason and clear thinking, Herm is not the ultimate determinant. And yes, I spelled determinant wrong the ultimate determinant of whether or not people belong in a padded cell. So you may ask, what determines whether or not someone belongs in a padded cell? Reality determines that, whether or not you accept reality. And these people don't accept reality. Quite honestly, let's take the pop culture definition of what insanity is. It's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's what these people do. Why do they do it? It's because they don't think reality is any fixed thing. It's in constant flux in some way in their minds, and therefore doing the same thing over and over again will have different results, because reality has changed, because reality is just a social construct. And so, again, if you're sane, you understand that no, reality is reality. And no, that's not just me defining it or someone else defining it. Reality defines itself. It slaps you in the face. It's like a bucket of cold water dumped over you saying, hey, hey, here I am. Deal with me. But again, these people do this same thing over and over again, and they do it because they think there is no fixed points in reality, and this is insane. As I said, they deny reality. That is delusion. They're delusional. And then they live their lives based upon this delusion. They're insane. So first of all, no, it's not that they're just causing harm and therefore they're insane. No, we should have diagnosed this as insane a long time ago, and we didn't, and so now they're causing harm. It went from just leave us alone to we want to celebrate this publicly to you have to accept our celebration of this publicly to we're going to force you to actually acknowledge and accept what we're doing publicly. And by the way, they do that by trying to enforce these politically correct forced speech laws, which is just a new form of blasphemy law. And then they went from that to say, oh, well, we're going to teach this to your children. And oh, by the way, if we teach it to them, we're also going to keep them secretly away from you and teach them this insanity and make this insanity part of their minds so much so that they might mutilate themselves for the rest of their life. And no, you're not going to have any say in it. I'm sorry, but we've gotten to this point where normal people are recognizing this insanity because no one dared to speak up against this insanity when people like this were spouting off this nonsense. And two little side notes off of that. First of all, someone might say, what's the difference between his arguments and my arguments? His is just on the left and mine's on the right. What's the difference? What's the difference is, as I said earlier in this video, if you wish to trace my arguments back through logic and reason to reality, I give you hopefully sufficient evidence to at least do that for yourself if I don't do it for you. But this person and the people who argue like this, you see all these books that he's quoting, these people that he's quoting? This is their interdependent circular reasoning. What this person does, this person himself, okay, he comes up with these theories and then he goes and he starts giving lectures about them after writing these giant tweet threads. And now he has a book and that book is going to be quoted by other people. And so when they get into a tight spot and they get caught with their circular reasoning, they say, no, no, just go back to this book. It explains everything. No, no, it doesn't explain anything. It's just more of your giant circular reasoning. None of it is actually based in reality in any way. 
and I know this specifically for this fellow himself because I've listened to his lectures. How does he begin with what he is trying to talk about? He says, well, let's take this theory. And from this theory, let's add these assumptions. And from this theory, plus these assumptions, we now see why society works in the way that the progressives always declare that society worked. No, that is not an argument in any way. That's just circular reasoning. You're saying, let's take a progressive theory, and in order to prove that the progressive theory is correct, we make assumptions, progressive assumptions, about that theory, and then apply it to other theories about progressivism, and they just confirm each other. Well, whoop de doo That's got zero to do with reality. And further to that, someone might say, well, you're saying this person belongs in a padded room. Well, they're in control. What if they say you belong in a padded room? I don't care. Why? Because I have reason, logic, and reality on my side, which gives me the keys to get out of a padded cell. All I gotta do is think my way out. But the point is that if you take an actual insane person and put them in a padded room, no, they don't have reason, logic, or an understanding of reality on their side, and therefore they stay in the padded room. And the reason why I'm saying all of this is because, of course, these people are now in control of society. And what are they doing with that control? Well, they're taking us sane people and they're trying to ghettoize us so that we have nothing to do with society. There's this guy that I listen to every once in a while on YouTube because he's fairly upbeat. What's the name of his channel? I don't know. It's like Black Conservative Perspective or something like that. But anyways, he watches The View all the time and goes on about this insanity that they're talking about. And here you had a clip from one of his videos where he's showing Whoopi Goldberg on The View. And Whoopi Goldberg apparently now looks like she ate three Whoopi Goldbergs from 1980. But she's talking about Donald Trump and how even if he gets convicted, he still might become president. And they're lamenting all of this. But the thing is that she will never actually say his name. There's no way she can be describing anyone else, but she says very awkwardly, this person can do that. And I'm thinking to myself, really? Honestly? You're so mentally disturbed. You're so ingrained in this mindset that people on the other side have to be ghettoized that you cannot even bring yourself to say their names. And this was reflected in the comic industry by a scene that took place, I think it was about two years ago right now, where Dan Slott was interacting with this guy on Twitter who was one of the people who laps up everything he says, and this guy was saying to Dan Slott, hey, I want to argue some of your points with Comicsgate because I think you're right. And Dan Slott said to him, no, if you actually interact with those people, I will block you. It doesn't matter if you're my fan and you believe everything I say. If you even speak with them, I will block you. This is how much these quote-unquote progressive people want to put you and I and other sane people into a ghetto so that we can never contaminate so-called their perfect society that they're trying to build. So much so, again, that they can't even interact with us, that they can't argue with us, that they can't speak with us, that they can't even say our names. And again, this is insane. But at the same time, my original point was we should be thankful for the fact that they're ghettoizing us in such a way. Why? Well, it may not work for society at large, but for these smaller parts of society, like the new comic industry that we're trying to build, it's best to keep these people as far away from you as possible. As I said, the reason why it's come to this point where these people are spouting off these things and actually harming others with some of the stuff they have to say because they're supporting harm to people like children is because no one called them on it when they started to spout this nonsense to begin with. But now we've been given a situation where we can build our own industry, small though it may be, and these people will be nowhere near it. They will not touch it. Because if they perhaps decide to buy your book, and if they want to buy my book, they can go right ahead. But if they decide to do something like buy your book and then read it and then do some of their so-called analysis of it, guess what's going to happen to them? The people on their side are going to shove them into the ghetto with us because you're not allowed to interact with us or the stuff we create. 
And as we sit behind this wall that they've created around us, we're using what we have to build and create things upon fundamental realities that actually work and are expressed through merit, and their contamination is nowhere to be found. And as they more and more try to build a wall, taller, thicker, so that they can, in some way, in their minds, seal us off from the rest of society, realize that this is a good thing. Why? Because all they're really doing is sealing themselves off from us. So instead of fighting against them, go along, nod, smile, and think to yourself as they seal themselves off, good riddance. So, if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe, and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this, and don't forget, the links are in the description and on the pinned comment for my three graphic novels. Alright, I'll leave it there. I'll see you later.